Hi and welcome everybody to day 4 of this year's summer school on the security of interconnected things. Hopefully you had a good morning with Johan showing you something about DDC hacks and now there's one more talk before the lunch break uh, with me and we will talk about comparison of field bus systems and protocols. As last time we will have a talk now and later on a little bit of an interactive discussion so that it's hopefully even more fruitful to you, every, to you guys. Okay, a quick recap who is talking. It's me, I'm Simeon Wiedemann. I'm a currently a security researcher at the University of Rostock at the uh, Institute of Computer Science with the Chair for Information and Communication Services with Professor Chap, where I also studied my bachelor's and master's in information technology and technical computer science. I also did a broad term, a, uh, a short term abroad in Spain, in Oviedo, uh, to, uh, for a master of web engineering. Then, before I was a researcher here at university, I was a software developer and in my free time I'm an enthusiast for privacy enhancing technologies like Signal and um, um, besides technical stuff, I love to play kayak polo and I'm a huge fan of Harry Potter and the methods of rationality. So you know who is talking, for those who haven't been there last time I talked. Today we will have a look at uh, what is a field bus and what is a protocol, then we will uh, look into the field of application domains for field buses and uh, before we focus on the typical properties of field bus systems which we'll use to describe and to, to compare field buses um, and then we have a look at some examples. Um, okay, we will start with what's a field bus. Apparently it's not a bus in the middle of a field which is just a funny picture I found on, uh, on the web but uh, we talk about field bus in a technical sense where multiple sensors and actuators uh, are connected via some transportation medium and they share this medium to do communication, to talk to each other. We are considering machine-to-machine -machine communications here where, for example, buttons and switches talk to smart lights, fans and shutters and all those kind of things. Uh, by now you saw some examples of KNX in the buildings, I guess, um, and they will reappear during this talk again. We call them smart because they, pro they, they possess processing power, some computational power, uh, which they use to perform communication with others. So um, it's not the traditional one where a light switch is hardwired to a lamp, and then you uh, intercept the circuit so that there is no electricity going and therefore no light and then you reconnect the circuit for the light. This is the old traditional one. Field bus uh, systems that are for example used for lightning in buildings, they are different. The bus uh, provides power supply to all components since they are computational components they need power, all of them, even the switch. And then there's only telegrams sent uh, which will uh, alter the behavior of actuators, for example, like a light. It will, for example, be a telegram sent to turn on the light. Okay, um, yeah, in the example of KNX, which is a typical field bus in building automation systems, we um, have various different uh, trans uh, transport media. For example, uh, uh, a twisted pair copper cable, which you see in the middle at the top. It's uh, isolated from the outside, the green, the green isolation you can see there. But um, even though this is the most common uh, media for, for KNX setup, there is others. You can also talk KNX via Ethernet, um, where you see an Ethernet cable in the middle. And there you can also talk KNX via power line. The characteristics of these uh, uh, technical problems possibilities, they vary. Um, and if you really look close enough to the picture, you may also see the wireless transportation medium, which uh, of course is possible. You can talk KNX on radio frequency as well. Um, yeah, um, I already mentioned the different uh, medium have uh, different characteristics, for example, different uh, bandwidth. Uh, okay. There's uh, another picture I found helpful to understand what's field buses. If we look at the uh, wiring cable, the, 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 the 
car cable loom, which is a typical uh, uh, cable loom of a passenger car. Um, it looks roughly like this. There's all sorts of components. The engine talks to locking, security from the key, uh, the transmission control, um, the user interface board that the driver has in front of him. There's all sorts of technical components. They talk to all sorts of other components, and there are uh, more. Uh, there's uh, feed buses which are part of the communication, or which take over the communication. And uh, traditionally, there were more than two kilometers of wires in a normal passenger car, which is, uh, of course, um, a lot of effort to set everything up. But it's also costs for the material and its weight. And uh, since cars get lighter and more efficient every day, uh, now modern cars uh, they use field bus systems. The most common one in the in the in the passenger car area is uh, probably uh, is the CAN bus and the controller area network bus. It's a serial bus system that was uh, developed in 1983 from by Bosch and Intel. It helps to save costs and weights and you can clearly see the difference between lots and lots of wires and only two pairs of wires per component and they are all together. Um, yeah, I already mentioned that CAN bus is the most prominent bus in cars. It has real-time capabilities. It has the option to control brakes, for example, or anti-blockage system, the engine, and all stuff like this. And there's different flavors of the of the can uh, of the CAN bus as well, and uh, add-ons and all these kind of things. Um, yeah. Uh, if you remember from the first talk that I gave, uh, we had a look at what is communication, and we found that communication uses a motivation to start and then messages that want to be exchanged are composed, encoded, and then transmitted via medium, where there will be noise added to the transmission. This is unfortunate, but this is the case in the reality. And then on the other side of the communication, there takes place a reception and the decoding before an interpretation of the transmitted message will be performed. If we ask ourselves now, where in this part of communication do field bus systems come in hand? Um, I already mentioned that they take over part of the communication. And of course, I talked about transmission media already, so definitely this is a big part of field bus systems. But field bus systems come in hand with protocols, and these protocols also define all sorts of uh, things. They will also define, for example, how messages be encoded or received and decoded, or even how messages are composed. For example, uh, to talk on, uh, uh, if a light switch talks to a lamp to turn on the light, the bus uh, and together the, the, the protocol will define how these telegram that is sent via, the, for example, twisted pair wire, will have to look like in order for the lamp to understand and make sense of it and eventually turn on the light. So this directly leads us to the question, what is a protocol? And to me, it is, um, I always have this one, one question, one, one, one sentence in my mind when I think about what is a protocol. The first thing that pops up in my mind is a uh, communication protocol is uh, the, the kind of a manual that explains who says what to whom. So to stay with our KNX example that I'm already using uh, a lot by now, the light switch will talk to the lamp to turn on the lights. And who needs to be identified by, for example, an identification, identification like a source address in a network. And of course, what that entity is saying needs to be specified, it's, it's the information that is exchanged. It might be a command, might be a measuring value, maybe encrypted, maybe authenticated. It's, it's not likely in, K, in the case of Kinex, but generally that could be the case. And of course, the to whom is also something that needs clarification. We need, for example, a destination address or some sort of mechanism how the recipient knows that the message was intended for that entity. But there's also more to it. For example, when will be the bus medium allocated to the sender? Uh, when does the receiver have to listen on the medium? And how is the technical realization, uh, which medium are used, uh, which characteristics are there for the, uh, for the 
transmission of information. Are we classically computer nerdy kind of sending zeros and ones over the wire? What does it mean to send a zero? What does it mean to send a one? Do we apply high voltage? How high is the voltage? But um, uh, you will learn more about this from Andy's, Andreas Ciastek's talk about the characteristics of uh, physical layer security. And there will also be a, a workshop, if I'm correct. Um, these kind of things are what a protocol defines. It's, it's something like a um, yeah, manual that explains how the system works and has to behave. And of course, um, describing the behavior is one thing, but sometimes stuff happens and, and things go wrong. What could go wrong in a communication like this? For example, multiple devices talk to each other and they are all connected to the bus where they get their power from and then there's the power outage. Suddenly, of course, the communication doesn't work. And how does the communication restart? What, what's happening now? We are in an unclear state. Depends on the, on the details of a protocol. Maybe the protocol shows something about, okay, in that kind of case, we restart with that and that state. Maybe it's not the case and uh, some technician needs to come and fix everything. There is um, all sorts of things like timing problems. If multiple devices talk via one medium, then it might even happen that they talk at the same time or they try to talk at the same time, which will result in co collisions and maybe in, in messages that are uh, unreadable. Of course, if there's a lot of noise, this noise can interfere with the communication. Maybe even uh, poorly designed protocols will in induce noise, introduce noise while, while taking care of other mechanisms. Interferences may be there, maybe uh, intended ones from an attacker with an evil, uh, evil mind. It could be that for some reason some invalid data is sent via the bus and what happens now? Is this in the invalid data recognized as invalid? Is it dropped? Does it cause some devices to have another male function? All these kinds of things can also be um, the be what an what an, a, a protocol can address and uh, prepare for. So if you find yourself ever in the spot to to define a protocol, then it's probably a good use to first think about what you need to do and why you need to have a protocol. Of course, you will by yourself come up with the idea of defining the intended behavior, but it's uh, rather likely a good idea to look at other protocols and see what they are preparing for, what kind of things they are describing for, uh, or uh, what, what kind of things they are describing, so that um, you don't miss the two obvious ones, but there will always be situations, scenarios that you probably do not prepare for. Maybe it's a good idea to know that and keep that in mind, but it's pretty much in the same in daily communications. If we talk to our mates and we have miscommunication, then it's often enough the case that this miscommunication is because something happened that we did not intend in our approach to communicate. Okay, um, yeah. Um, I already mentioned the protocol can do something like controlling who is talking to whom and when and how to, for example, handle collisions. There's other questions like, is a communication fair? Meaning, can every participant talk eventually or will there be extroverted devices which talk all the time and leaving no room for other devices which for, for some ranking are lower in priority, for example? Or how long does it take, even if there's fairness, how long does it take for each and every device to finally be activated? If we think of an anti-blockage system in your car, it's a really good question to know precisely how long it, does, uh, it, it may take for the ABS to finally be activated because only then you know what is the maximum reaction time before your brake works the way it is intended to work. Is the protocol deterministic? Do you know by when that will happen? Is it re real-time capable? All these kind of things depend on uh, the protocol and of course the field bus system is always involved with the protocol. Okay. Um, I, pro uh, I promise that we'll have a look at application domains of field buses. And again, I'll reuse a slide from my last talk, which you have seen before. That's why you see the recap in the top right corner. There's 
multiple technologies and it happens to be that they are domain specific. Uh, for example, in buildings you will find the KNX, which is the successor of the European installation bus. There will, there will, there, there's also LON and BACnet, for example. In cars, the most, by far most prominent is the CAN bus, the control area network bus. And in industrial automation, they, there's even, I'd say, more sophisticated buses. For example, like the Profi bus, uh, are, they tend towards uh, real-time Ethernet by now because in industries it's, it's getting even more important that uh, the communication is real-time capable. Um, yeah, I used the slide last time for communication systems and how they look like because essentially field buses are communication systems, so it's easy to reuse them now. And I also came up with this slide to show you that behind the building, of course not the building is the, is the field bus, but the components, the smart components, they're talking to each other inside the building. Not the car as the field bus, but the smart parts of the car, the computers inside, maybe the wires inside, the technology, the sensors, the actuators inside the car. And of course, not the factory itself, but the sensors and actuators in the field, the valves, the ventiles, the programmable logical controllers. Yeah, so uh, that is, of course, what is really part of the field bus application. Uh, yeah. So in buildings, it might look like this. We have multiple devices with a single medium, for example, the KNX bus, twisted pair. You can also interconnect multiple parts of, uh, multiple configurations of KNX and the part will be talking twisted pair and the other part will talk via power line and all these kind of things, but they come with a configuration effort. Uh, there are seating devices, there's climate devices, ventilation, lightning, shading, monitoring, the entire energy management can be automated and operated from the road via the KNX, which is pretty much the European standard. Uh, talk to lights, switches, via one bus line. And of course, I also said it, the power will be supplied by the bus. Um, yeah, so imagine the orange line would be a twisted pair cable, then the um, the um, the, uh, the throughput of communication that you could uh, send via the twisted pair, uh, twisted pair cable setup of KNX would be at maximum 9.6 kilobits per second. Um, there, this uh, this data rate differs with other trans, uh, trans transport media, for example, radio frequency or power line. Yeah, in factories you will uh, see a lot of programmable logical controllers, for example the Siemens schematics, and they, they, they control in hopefully real time and monitor the, and allow dynamic adaptation of the automation processes that happen uh, to be in the factory. And yeah, why do they do this in the factories? They want to have high productivity, they want to have high comfort to control everything from a central control room, like you can see in the pictures. Uh, they want to reduce the turnover and reduce the expenses while keeping maintainability and control high. Yeah, in cars, we already talked about the controller area network, which is the most prominent one. Um, you can, for example, unlock doors, control air conditioning and systems like that. You can uh, control active brakes, like the adaptive cruise control will be communicating via CAN bus. You can even control steering and assist in parking and all these kind of things because the components are wired together via the CAN bus. And I already mentioned that there are different flavors of, of CAN bus and there's even different setups of CAN buses in, within a car. For example, you can have CAN bus in, in ring topology. We will talk about the topologies later again. And then you can have multiple rings, for example, a high-speed ring for brakes and engine controls, like the really, really important components of your car, because if you want to brake, then the brake should hit right away. And you could have another low-speed ring for convenient equipment. And, of course, in that case, messages that are sent via a low ring should not be capable of reaching the high-speed ring, because that would interfere with the with the timing and maybe destroy the communication on the fast 
high speed ring to send uh, really, really important commands like hit the brake now. Yeah, these messages on a canvas, they are sent via message ID so that the component can be identified and of course there's a payload telling the recipient why this message was sent in the first place. For example, one, one flavor is the, is the Flex Ray, which is available since 2000. It's a serial deterministic and fault tolerant CAN compatible uh, uh, bus system. There's also the LIN bus, which is a local interconnect network, which is available since about 2001. It's an inexpensive alternative used to connect doors and motor driven adjustable seats, for example. Um, there's MOSTBUS, which is a media-oriented system transport, available since 2007. It is good in fast transmission of multimedia data, so that you can have audio and video and voice signals transport in the speed and bandwidth you would like to. Um, I mention this because even though CAN is the most prominent, it doesn't mean that in one car there's only CAN bus. There's all sorts of buses and they're specialized in their application domains and the application domains can be more detailed than cars for example. Um, I thought about putting lots and lots of technical details about for example Canvas into this presentation and then I figured it might be boring to listen to all these kind of uh, information and then getting rushed through and I am not a CAN expert either so these kind of presentations exist and you can find them easily and available online. If you are interested in it, there has been a, a very and informative talk about car hacking and getting from, it's, it's titled Car Hacking, Getting from A to B with uh, Women. And it's, I think it's about a 90 minutes talk that has been presented at the Still Hacking Anyway 2017 conference, SHA 2017. And I will include a link in the presentation so that you can have a look if you're interested. Okay, uh, other applications than buildings and cars is, uh, for example, maritime vessels. There's lots and lots of things uh, on, on, in, in ships and, and ports that, are, uh, that, that communicate. Uh, the, autom the automation takes place in this sector as well. Of course, ships have communication systems. They have navigation and electronic sea mapping systems which talk to each other. There's even autopilot systems using sensors, actuators, and uh, of course user interfaces that talk to each other. They have, um, uh, for example, uh, the information of estimated time of arrival, which says when a ship will reach a port. This is not an unimportant number, and it's not only for the convenience of the captain to know when, he's be there, when he will be there, but it's also that arriving a port in a uh, means you have to have a, a slot available for your, for example, cargo ship. If it's not free time but industry, then your cargo ship or your ferry will have to uh, reach the port during a special slot because then the entire in, uh, um, setup that, that the entire, uh, um, sorry, the entire uh, collection of things that happens after the ship reaches the port, for example, unloading the ship and reloading the ship, it is scheduled and there's many, many other people depending on that. So if uh, a ship misses that slot, it's really expensive for the owners of the ship. So they really want to make sure they know when they will be arriving and of course they can, uh, can, can set up communication systems to get this information quite frequently and update it and then talk to the ports, for example. So this is where, why, why ships are tracked, for example, so that you can plan ahead. And there's cargo balance systems that use automation. automation. There's dynamic positioning systems in, on the ship. There's sea traffic management regulation components that are automated and talk to each other. And of course, you can automate your cruise ship, your private yacht, for example. One example would be the NMAEA, the National Marine Electronics Association, which came up with a field bus for, for maritime vessels. Um, for example, to connect your GPS receiver, your autopilot, the wind instruments that measure what, what wind speed is there, the depth founders that figure out whether your, whether your yacht will be capable of going this way, navigational instruments, engine, engine instruments, 
not the chart plotters, all these kind of systems that you have. You can uh, interconnect them by a bus on your ship and they will talk to each other. And yeah, it's again a field bus, like in the building. It's not quite, quite like KNX, for example. Uh, a little bit different technical setup, and this is pretty much wherever you go. If you have two, the two field buses in two different areas, then it's always the same concepts. Multiple sensors, actuators, devices, talking by a one medium or a set of uh, media, and they share these uh, communication media and um, medium, sorry. And um, yet you will find quite a lot of differences um, in the technical realizations, in how a message is constructed or how a message is processed, for example. And it's also a um, topic for research. For example, here at the University of Rostock, of course, our chair investigates the security of uh, field bus protocols in all sorts of uh, domains. But um, it's also from the other side. Uh, there has been a research project called Galileo Nautic, which uh, took place from 2016 to, to 2018, uh, where a part of a university, together with the Federal Ministry of Economics and Technology of Germany, came up with a pro project which has about roughly half a million euros funding. Um, it was uh, with the Institute for Automation Technology, uh, and they tried to to design and to come up with a system that ca is capable of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, controlling uh, the, the, the ships. So uh, in safety critical areas like harbors, uh, where there's limited, limited space in the dimension, where there's high traffic occurrence, uh, so high demanding environment, the ship uh, may be commanded and narrowed through waterways automatically, for example, unmanned, uh, and even uh, in situations where there's something happening that nobody could foresee. So the autonomous navigation and optimization maneuvering took time to come up with ideas, and uh, apparently people start to understand that we need to, uh, to pay attention, to, to pay uh, effort into research so that the systems that we are using in such scenarios that are capable of, uh, that, are, that are taking over the communication, that they uh, are precise and reliable and work. Okay, um, we talked a lot about where field buses uh, could be uh, used. We talked a lot about what is a field bus and uh, the corresponding protocol and what can be defined uh, uh, as part of uh, a component of a field bus. Now let's have a look at the typical properties of field bus systems. One could, of course, come up with the questions, why do we use them? Yeah, um, every here and there, there has been some drop of information for this, so maybe you, you got it already. There are, of course, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, people hope that they could increase the comfort and the flexibility of their system of their scenario, of their building, of their car, of their factory, whatever they, the concrete setup we are talking about now. They would like to re reduce the expenses, for example, especially during runtime. In setups like mobile setups like cars, it is uh, important that uh, the material costs and uh, or the weight for lots and lots of cables could be reduced by uh, using a field bus system. Of course, maintainability of complex systems is uh, an important topic. With a field bus, you may be able to collect multiple sensor data and see what this, the current and maybe life behavior of multiple actuators. So if you put all these kind of information together, for example, in a control room, you can maintain and control what's happening much better than if everything is set up and wired directly and hardly, because then uh, uh, hardwired, then uh, you would have to go to all the places and see what's going on. If there's something going wrong, you can of course have a better view by uh, having all the information together from multiple parts of your system. But there's not only advantages but also disadvantages as always. Most likely the installation costs will be higher. Um, Maybe you already got it, there is a lack of security. Connecting multiple devices, 
some that are probably not even too sophisticated or rather cheap. Maybe some systems allow to connect devices from all sorts of vendors, so you don't even have a control on the behavior of these kind of devices. It definitely definitely will increase the, increase the attack surface, and also it will allow uh, remote attacks if there are gateways in the communication systems, so that you can transport information to the internet. Then, of course, this can be hijacked. The attack potential rise, raises by the amount of, in, of connected uh, components, of course, because if there is multiple technical uh, components, then the interest is most likely higher that uh, there is uh, in, in something. So uh, uh, if it's only one computer not connected to anything else, then of course the computer is something exciting, but if it's hundreds and hundreds of computers sensing all sorts of, of values, for example, heating value, uh, humidity values, all these kind of things that could be an important uh, insight knowledge for, for uh, the production in a factory, then attackers are more and more likely to really want to know what's going on there because with, uh, with accessing the field bus you can get a lot and lot of information. Um, of course the complexity can also be higher, not only lower, and higher complexity makes it harder to maintain everything, even though the idea is to have it easier to maintain. And of course, there's another aspect. If you use field bus systems, then you need special tools and special skills, for example. In the case of buildings, where you use KNX as a field bus, you would have to configure everything in the beginning with the engineering tool software. And this is something that the the workers that set up the system, they need to be in, they need to be taught at, uh, taught these kind of things. So it's most likely that the setup costs are higher. For example, for the personnel that has to know the entire insights of engineering tool software to configure your building, while every electrician would be capable of hard wiring a switch to a light. This is some special knowledge, and therefore you probably cannot choose each and every one, uh, electrician. Worker. Okay, uh, this slide is very dense. It contains a lot of information, and it, if you want to sum up this, uh, the takeaways for comparing field buses, then this is the slide. Um, I collected some of the ideas to describe and, of course, also compare field bus systems, uh, some suggestions for criteria. Um, field buses interconnect sensors with actuators via bus medium, of course. But that's, and there's lots and lots of proper properties that, uh, that it's worth to, to, to take a look at. For example, topologies. There's various topologies that devices could be interconnected with via a special uh, topology. And I'll uh, shortly after that, we will uh, pay, um, have a look at, at topologies. There is the question of, is there central or decentral communication on the bus? Is there, for example, a bus master? that uh, takes care of the entire communication for the bus and manages everything, like giving out ac uh, access tokens to individuals so that they know when they are allowed to talk, or is it decentral so that all the devices can decide on their own, I want to talk, I have something to talk, and without consulting a master. There's also uh, examples for, for these kind of uh, variations. The transmission media already uh, has been mentioned as a component that can be varying even for one field bus, like KNX. It's not one field bus, it's a field bus system, and this field bus system is capable of communicating via a twisted pair cable. It's also capable of talking via radio frequency or via power line. And then there are some technical components, like for example the data rate that varies with the transmission medium. The communication mode uh, is, is another property probably worth looking into when comparing buses with others. Are the devices talking one to one? Are they talking one to multiple other devices or one to all other devices? In other words, are they using single multicast or broadcast communication? What is the security property of a specific field bus with a specific medium? Is it, uh, is it something uh, that is uh, very safety critical or is it something like a building when 
when KNX, for example, has been decided, the idea, of course, was, okay, the wires inside the walls of buildings, there's, this is not an attack surface. Nobody's is, um, opening the wall and attaching something to the wires in, in order to compromise the building. But since these kind of buildings are more and more networks and they're more and more complex and these networks even span over multiple buildings uh, and also have access to sensitive areas of buildings, they became attack surfaces. So, yeah. Another very formal thing is uh, to look at the address scheme of the, of the technology you, you use. There might be systems that just call out to the wild their information and everybody that is interested in information is listening to it. There's these public subscribe systems. There's address schemes that uh, give each device uh, an individual address, like for example a physical KNX address. And uh, KNX, for example, uses logical addresses where they can have a multicast uh, to, to, to then send the payload in, in, in action. Another aspect is counting the number of participants of a field bus system. How many, how many uh, communication partners can take place in the net, can be part of the network. This might be a number you reach, this might be a number that is not so important because you only have a few communication partners, but it's definitely worth considering uh, before you buy an entire system and then you find out Damn it, the system only supports 100 communication partners and I need 5,000, then this is probably not your system. Or at least you need to come up with a way to scale your, this uh, concrete setup. Um, we already mentioned the real-time capabilities. If you have something like controlling a brake in a car that is running, you then want to make sure to know by what time, once a user hits the brake, the brake actually is activated. And there's lots of scenarios where it's important to know that the command will eventually be executed. And there's also scenarios like the one I just mentioned, where we really want to make sure that the command is executed by a maximum of x time units. Uh, not all systems are capable of this kind of things. There are systems that are even not capable of confirmation that the command is actually executed. They just fire and forget. But there are systems and technologies and field bus setups where you can have these properties. We already talked a little bit about co collisions and I will talk more about it. But if multiple t uh, participants in a network try to talk at the same time, they might interfere and the communication may be unreadable. The uh, main catchphrases here are CSMA C CD and CSMA CA. And, um, I will talk about them again shortly. The fairness I also mentioned before is every participant in the network eventually be able to communicate or will there be messages that will never be heard because the participants just never got around to send their communication. In an evil scenario setup you could imagine uh, somebody is always talking uh, and over talking what you are saying for example, if you're in a classroom and there's somebody that doesn't like you and every time you open your mouth, they just yell. Nobody would understand what you say and all the time. And in an attack scenario, this could of course be the case. Uh, but then again, it's a question of the, the, the setup, the technology, the concrete field bus, the implementations, whether there is a situation where it could happen that uh, you will never be heard at all or whether the protocol will uh, make sure that eventually you will have your spot. Um, there's also other parameters that are less deterministic, like uh, traffic patterns. For example, in a factory that automates a, a process of constructing a car, you would probably uh, see all the same uh, patterns in the, in the telegram sent via the communication media for the automation system. For example, after the left door was added to the car, the right door will be added to the car. So the sensor on the, on the right door side will then detect that the car appears after the sensor on the left side uh, detected the car on the left side has been appeared. And since it's in a in, uh, more and more industrial area, the, the, the patterns like 
detecting a door on the left and then 20 seconds later detecting a door on the right side will be very, very constant. It will show up all the time. It's not the case, for example, if, if you look at motion detection, motion, motion detection telegrams that, that are sent by a motion detector in a building, uh, it's probably more random because sometimes in the official building like a university, hardly nobody's there due to some pandemic and nobody's working in the office. And in other years where there is, for example, no pandemic, but there's uh, a very important meeting, many people will walk across the floor, so there will be lots and lots of telegrams. These kind of patterns may also be a property worth to uh, look at when comparing field buses. And depending on your application scenario, it might be a very interesting thing to pay attention to those kind of things. Of course, this is not a complete list. This is uh, just a suggestion for criteria to describe and compare field buses with. And you're more than welcome to use these kind of criteria to, to investigate your own field buses, to compare them to others. We will later on go through the list again and uh, look at the properties for KNX. But I promise that I will talk about field bus typo topologies and this is what I'll do now. The most uh, traditional ones are the, 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 oh yeah, on the left side you see the ring uh, topology, which is multiple uh, communication participants connected via one ring. Um, and on Next uh, on the right is uh, a line, like the, cl the classical bus setup that uh, you saw in the, the depiction of KNX before. Um, there's the star-like topologies where you have a central communication unit. Of course, if that central communication unit fails, then the entire network is broken because nobody can uh, talk to any other component without the central component. Uh, funnily enough, if I think of the star topology, then it reminds me of the public transport in, in Thailand. Because if you want to go from place A to place B, it's always you go from place A to Bangkok and then you go from Bangkok to place B if you want to take a public bus because there's just no bus going directly without going to Bangkok first. So these kind of topologies don't only happen in, in computer science, they happen in real life as well. And of course, uh, you can mix this kind of things up. You can come up with tree structures. Um, let's have a look at the, at, the, at the ring structure again. The ring structure has the one, one, one interesting uh, thing to mention. You could uh, imagine a token that is handed to one communication partner, and then this token is sent for example, clockwise in the ring structure, and with each participant this token uh, 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 reaches, you can calculate the time uh, this, this, uh, part, uh, this communication partner will need to process the information in there, and after it's done one full circle, you know uh, each participant in, on, on the bus could ha had the chance to, to listen to your message. Uh, this also allows, uh, for example, if you gather data and you, you ask all the temperature sensors to add, uh, add their value, you can, for example, send a request and all the nodes along the way that are happen to be uh, uh, temperature sensors, they could just uh, add their value to the end of the current message and then it's like a, like a trail that, uh, that, that grows in size and by the time it reaches the beginning, the, the the communication part that actually asked for the temperature got all the temperature information from all the sensors at once. But of course, imagine one connection fails, then it's not quite dead yet because theoretically, and depending on the setup, you could then go back and forth and uh, eventually reach every component uh, in, in the system. But So if you imagine we cut this um, this connection, uh, then the communication could still take place around the gap. This is true uh, unless a second uh, connection is interrupted, like this. Then you would have two sub subnets. These three components could then still communicate, and those two could still communicate, but they could not communicate with each other anymore. Of course, these kind of uh, thoughts can be applied to multiple scenarios here. If you cut a, a connection in, in a star topology, then only one component will not be there. 
if you cut a connection in the three component, it depends which component this. This would only cut off one computer communication partner. This, of course, would uh, cut away the entire left bottom part. And yeah, here the sim scenario would be similar. Um, I promised to talk about coalition handling. Um, I already mentioned that uh, the co coalition handling is often uh, uh, described by carrier sans multiple access or short CSMA and there's various flavors of collision handling but the two main com concepts behind it is do the communication partners that are communicating via a field bus detect that there is a collision in talking uh, and if they do detect it do they just detect it or can they handle it so the most simple case is they just collect it and of course uh, uh, same as here these computer icons are just symbols for whatever uh, device that is a part of your field bus network could be a sensor could be an actuator they uh, at some point have some computational power so i just depicted them here or actually i used the pictures from wikipedia so they are depicted as computers but that doesn't mean it has to be a desktop computer of course okay and when, when, when handling collisions, the most simple case would be to just detect the collision. It's also called CSMA CD for carrier sense multiple access collision detection. How could this look like? Imagine this uh, communication partner, this device would like to talk via the bus. And now a second component also tries to start talking via the bus medium. Of course, at some point the information is progressed on, on, the, on the shared medium and uh, at some point they will overlap and it will be malfunctioning you can we the other components will not be able of understanding what has been said if each and every device listens to the bus and compares it with what they actually sent so uh, for example component a which was talking in the beginning uh, started to talk to the bus and listened at the same time and realized that at some point there was something on the bus that was not sent by him and the same observation could be done by uh, by participants too uh, they they could realize the collision and then they could stop the transmission and resend it or at least they know that the other part of the communication would not be capable was not capable of understanding what has been said this is what is meant by carrier sense multiple access collision detection. If the devices realize, oh, something went wrong. Uh, of course, it uh, is. Uh, yeah, it gets back to the to the talking devices, so that they know. Okay, uh, my communication attempt was not uh, successful. There is also the option of carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance where we not only detect it but we we avoid it in some way I think the name is not quite um, describing it in, in, in detail because after detection react reacting on it and then avoiding the the throw away of the communication is what actually happens and um, I'll again try to describe it and uh, we have our our bus set up again and component A would like to send and component B would like to send. So they first listen to the media. They check out is somebody talking on the media. This is uh, the dotted line should, 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 should reassemble it. Since the main bus line is black so no communication takes place they think ah, okay I'm fine I can talk now. This is helpful because if some large message already been sent then for a long time the bus will be occupied and listening to it at some point during the long transmission time would already help and the components would stop talking. But of course it could happen that both components listen at the same time and they both think that nobody is talking and then they start talking. We have the same problem as before. Eventually the shared media will realize something is wrong and uh, it is a coalition. A coalition. Now the same com concept as before. The actively talking components could also listen to the bus at the same time, and then they would realize that 
there is a collision. And then there could be, for example, a priority, prioritization scheme. For example, if um, this was con component A, and this was component B, and this was component C, and this was component D, and we'd say, uh, if there's a collision, then in alphabetical order, A has the priority to talk first. Then B would realize, ah, there's a, priori uh, there's a, there's a conflict. And uh, for example, from, from the source information that is in the telegram, B could realize this communication that I started was interfering with a communication that A started, and A has higher priority than, than I. Do so. I stop talking in order to prevent the telegram from A to be unreadable for the others. And then component B would shut up talking, and this would avoid the collision. Not directly, the collision took sort of place, but it would avoid that the collision causes the telegram to be have to be thrown away. In other vocabulary, for example, in Canvas, then sometimes it's called carry sense multiple access collision resolution, which is more uh, a more precise name, I guess. OK, uh, in the slide where we uh, had a look at properties to compare feed buses with, uh, yeah, in this slide, there was also the, the, the uh, point security properties. Um, and this is what we want to look next. Um, security properties have been uh, mentioned before in my first talk. So we had the property of confidentiality. Is the message that is sent between the participants only available for the participants and may be prevented from uh, eavesdropping, for example? The example was that a light zone telegram is sent from the, uh, from the buttons to the lamp. And if somebody wants to listen to it that is not supposed to listen to it, maybe encryption or other technologies would uh, prevent them from uh, uh, actually reading the information. Then a field bus would have the property of confidentiality. There was the property of integrity, which uh, meant that when a telegram like lights on the scent, from one, uh, from one participant in the communication, it eventually reaches the other side or during the entire lifetime, it, the data remains the same. And if there are some alterations in the data, for example, at some point suddenly the telegram says lights off, then at least we would like to detect it and not act on it because if the alteration of the data was not intended, then integrity is the property to not use it if there has been unintended alteration of the data. The availability uh, I depicted in my last uh, talk like this. Uh, if there's a telegram that needs to be sent, all the participants, the buttons, the media, the lamp, all have to be available. And of course, for some reasons, they might not be available. Cutting a wire is a very obvious one, but you could also just jam the wire by by talking noise to the wire. And um, it's hard to come up with te uh, technical systems that have really, really, really high availability. But maybe your feedback system has thought about the idea and uh, has some concepts to, for example, mute participants or uh, interference or deal with these kind of situations. And of course, if you cut the wire, then your technical system will not be capable of, of, uh, of providing the availability. Um, but redundancy may help, and monitoring may help uh, to achieve this with your field bus. Is the communication authorized? Meaning, are the devices that we're talking, devices that are supposed to be talking, that have some authorization from uh, a central point? For example, sending a lights on telegram should be allowed by an authorized device like a switch, but an attacker should not be capable of maybe not be capable of adding its own buttons to the system, just wiring them up and sending the telegram and then controlling the light. Especially uh, if you think about, for example, fingerprinting systems to uh, to uh, to do access control for doors, which you can buy on as a component of a KNX system, 
But since uh, you may already know, the KNX bus is not encrypted, it's not authorized, uh, it's not authenticated. So if by, by my own fingerprinter uh, device or if I just uh, observe the telegram that has been sent by the, the fingerprint device when a person came that actually was able to access it and then I, I resend this telegram from another device I just wired to the bus and the door is open, then of course this is not what the user probably wanted when they bought the extra secure fingerprinter door opener for its new building automation system. So uh, hopefully this helps you to understand why this may be, a impo may be an important property for, for your field bus system. Of course, depends on your applications. I also mentioned the telegram distribution um, and um, during our research, we came up with the question whether the, the telegram distribution can tell you something about the system. I already mentioned the example of the public building where maybe all the people that work there, they come from Monday to Friday and on Sunday, Saturday and Sunday there's fewer activity or none uh, in the building. So motion detectors that will trigger telegrams as soon as they detect the person they would have a lot of load on the bus, they would put a, lo a lot of load on the bus during the weekdays, but not on the weekends, which, for example, could resemble the blue telegram type A. But of course, not only weeks, it could also be a working day. The people come in the morning, some come early, a few come a little bit later, all of them are there during the day, and then in the evening, it's a little bit few, uh, it's, it's a few, uh, a few, few person, and later on, almost none, again. These kind of cycles could be user-induced cycles, like I just uh, explained with the motion detection. But of course, they could be protocol-induced uh, because of the, the uh, defined specific behavior of the protocol could be that the protocol at the beginning sends a few initialization telegrams, and later on there's all the time uh, check-up telegrams defined by the protocol setup. Um, there could be determined sequences of events, like type B should be uh, describing here, uh, type C, sorry. So uh, when some motion detector fires, then a light has to, is, is going to turn on and the, uh, uh, the ventilation is, has to be turned on like the red one. So they come in bunches, I'd say. Every time the light detector is fired, this means a person is on the floor, so we should turn on the light and we should make sure the person gets some fresh air. So the telegrams will always occur together. And of course, uh, machine-induced cycles would be very periodic, like type B. For example, uh, check up telegrams that uh, are sent by a bus that uh, asks if there's a new participant every X time, time units, for example. Yeah, and uh, maybe taking a look at your application domain, maybe taking a look at a setup uh, infrastructure, this can help you to understand why there's collisions on the bus or why the bus behaves very efficient during one time in the day and not during others. Okay, now let's talk about some concrete examples. The KNX field bus has been talked about a lot and you already know a little bit about it, I'm still reusing it here. It has been the European norm, uh, international standard, open standard. You can register for it, you can find information on www.knx.org. Um, you see some devices here. Um, and yeah, we'll have a short glimpse on addressing and telegram structure shortly. Um, it's a European international standard. So it's official, multi-vendors use it to, uh, to certify their devices, which they can get from the KNX association, and then you can configure multiple vendor uh, uh, independently devices. Uh, sorry, you can then configure multiple devices, not depending from all on the same vendor, uh, via the engineering tool software to set up your modern house or building. Okay. The physical addressing in KNX, each device has its unique uh, physical address, which is 
uh, 4-bit area, 4-bit line and 8-bit device information. So there are up to 15 areas with up to 15 li uh, lines per area with uh, yeah, up to 265 uh, devices per line if it's a, uh, the setup of uh, uh, the, the 265 uh, KNX. You can also have a line that contains of four segments with e each uh, having uh, 64 devices only. The, the topology could be tree, line or star like, you cannot uh, do a ring. And one line, for example, has a maximum length of a, th uh, a thousand meters, uh, just to make sure that the timing when a telegram is sent has, is, is proper so that it would reach all the devices um, and in time. Yeah, um, during the normal behavior of the network, of uh, it, they may ah sorry the four bit area line and devices for example the one with the address two point one point one is the first device in line one in area two. Um, yeah, the physical address in KNX is uh, is is used to to determine the devices, but the logical address is used during communication. There are uh, two setups. You can have a main group uh, and a subgroup of 5 and 11 bits, or you can have main, middle, and subgroup of 5, 3, and 8 bits, and then one uh, communication object per, per group. You can have one, sorry, you can have one sending device, which, um, for example, in this case is the f bolt uh, device. It's in the group one slash one slash one and it sends for example a turn off the lights when you leave your building and then it will for example turn off the lamps that are part of the group one slash one slash one which for example could be two in your floor one in your living room and one in your garage and they will all be sent off by the same telegram so you can do these kind of things um, yeah, more technical details. If you look at the, the data the telegram, uh, you can have uh, normal telegrams or extended telegrams for, with more payload. Telegrams may be a uh, repetition of telegrams that have been sent before. So uh, in the control field of uh, your telegram, the type is uh, defined. One is for normal telegrams, zero is for extended telegrams. and if the in the, con the the fifth bit in the control field is a zero, then it is a repetition of a telegram that has been sent before. There is some priority that defines uh, which message should be sent before another in case of, for example, collision. Um, yeah, um, there is an acknowledge telegram that would have a special uh, form. Uh, it would have uh, a zero on in the control field on on uh, five four one and zero. Then you have a sixteen bit source address. You have a sixteen plus one destination uh, address. The plus one is the destination address flag, which helps you to determine whether the destination address is actually a physical address which you need for configuration or a logical address which you would need during live uh, uh, usage, like turning on the lights. And then there's a routing, routing counter, uh, taking sure that the devices will not, uh, that the telegrams will not live forever. It could be up to seven and each hop is decreased by one and once it's, it's reached zero, the telegram is no longer be forwarded. And then there's the information of the length for the payload, which may be 2 to 16 bytes. At the end, there's parity, 8-bit, to check if uh, some, something was, was wrong with the telegram. And then the parity will be cap helpful for the recipient to realize, ah, something has happened, this telegram may be not valid. Mm. You have various broadcast domains in KNX. The lines are typically broadcast domains. Since uh, it's uh, usually an unencrypted communication uh, uh, in the broadcast domain of one line, each message that has been sent can be read by all the devices. Um, since there is no integrity, altered telegrams 
uh, can easily be sent. For example, you can just overwrite telegrams that have been sent uh, at the time where they send the one bit with a more dominant zero bit on the bus. Uh, if you have uh, sure, uh, precise enough timing, it would be theoretically possible. Um, the, of course, this is a sophisticated uh, tech idea. Uh, you could add gateways to uh, allow remote access, for example, via Ethernet. And of course, you can easily denial of service these kind of networks by cutting the wire, by unlawfully talking without breaking intervals, for example, th that have been defined by the protocol. And yeah, Johannes Goltz, uh, who will also talk, you, talk to you about KNX, um, he did some experiments uh, uh, investigating the behavior of of these line couplers that, that couple lines to areas and uh, uh, had a look at what are they going to send and what not. And yeah, I put uh, the, uh, a link to his research uh, in the slides as well. So if you're interested in, in this, uh, then listen to his talks and maybe read his work. Uh, we also had some, some ideas in, in, in our working group and some students that did work here. Oh, sorry. The animation just... Uh, uh, shows what uh, I already mentioned. So the, the, the bolt device talks and uh, all these areas will get the message uh, because they have participants that are signed up for the one slash one slash one in them. So all the orange uh, uh, circumvented components of the network will be capable of reading the device, uh, the, the telegram that's sent by, by, the, by the sender. Yeah. And then I mentioned we had some research going on, some students, Martin Peters, for example, investigated whether it's possible to add a single device in, in all, to add a single device in, uh, in all the broadcast domains. That's like an agent collecting some information, for example, recording telegrams sent and compressing information like five telegrams sent in the last five minutes, and then send it uh, via the network to a central collector to increase the security as just one idea. Um, I promised that we would have a look at the properties I mentioned earlier and go through it for Kinex. For Kinex, the topologies that you can do is interconnect uh, trees and lines with a maximum of 1000 meters and stars. It's a decentral communication, so you don't need to have a master that is uh, allowing you as a component in the KNX network to talk. There's other regulations to get this done. For the transmission medium, I mentioned twisted pair, power line, radio frequency or over IP. And uh, the transmission medium also defines a data rate, which would be, for example, maximum 9.6 kilobit per second for a twisted pair, but could be 1.2 kilobits per second only for power line. The communication mode would be one to one or one to multi. Uh, the security properties are not that good. It's usually unencrypted and unauthorized. There is um, updates plugins, uh, extensions, I mean, for the KNX bus uh, that try to alter this slowly, but usually the setup is it's unencrypted, unauthorized. Um, the address scheme we talked about, it's uh, individual physical addresses for setup and uh, reconfigurations and grouped logical addresses for for m multicast communications. Mm, the number of participants, uh, of course, since we have four segments, each can uh, uh, we have fifteen areas. Each area can have fifteen lines, and each line can have uh, four segments of sixty-four devices, or one time two hundred and sixty-five devices. You can. Um, calculate the number of participants in your network depending on how much you use but you also have the, the maximum number. Uh, KNX is not real-time capable. They do not have reliable confirmation. Um, the collision handling is done via collision detection, uh, collision avoidance I mean, sorry. Uh, the individual telegrams uh, sent on the bus are also listened to and depending on their, uh, uh, their address there's a priority, and the lower address has the higher priority, so the higher address will stop talking and avoiding the damage of the telegram so that the first telegram can be sent 
and the second telegram has to be stopped and sent later without interfering the first one. There is no fairness guaranteed in the bus. Hopefully everybody has enough time to talk, but it's not guaranteed. And the traffic patterns, I try to show you that they are really depending on your individual setup. Okay, another domain would be maritime vessels. For example, there is uh, the NMEA uh, 0.183. It's an open standard uh, based on the serial communication interface of RS-422. And it needs two wires per direction to communicate. Uh, the communication mode is one-to-one -one only. And uh, sorry, not only this is one-to-one, -one, but multicast is possible, and there is a um, bandwidth of 4.8 kilobits per second. Uh, NMNA for, uh, means National Maritime Electronics Association. The standard is open, as in you pay standard, but you can you can sign the license agreement if you pay enough uh, money. And even though the standard is 35 years old, it's used for leisure and commercial vessels. Um, a bidirectional communication needs two pairs of wires, as you can see in the schematics. And uh, the communication works by sending printables, 8-bit ASCII characters. There's a start bit, a logical zero, and eight data bits, and a stop bit, which is a logical one. There's no parity bits, for example, to check uh, if something went wrong. And the signal level uh, depends on the interface. Could be transistor transistor logic or RS232. Yeah. And uh, for, for the transistor transistor logic, for example, the low would be some voltage value between 0 and 0 0.8, and the high value would be something between 2 and 5 voltage. Since the first NMEA standard is already quite old, the, there is a newer version, the NMEA2000 which is a pay stand, paid standard that you can sign the license agreement and an NDA and uh, your hardware again needs uh, certification as well uh, to guarantee that the hardware is interoperable. Um, not all aspects are available, this is why there exist GitHub repositories like the CANBOAT one where people try to reverse engineer the meanings of some fields and already it's 15 years and older. Uh, it's slowly adopted, but new boards usually use the NMEA 2000. It allows faster communication with less wires, less weight. It's also uh, um, making use of the control area network, as we know from the cars. For example, it uses cyclical redundancy check to validate the telegram sent, and it even is possible to, uh, to use CanCrypt to support AI, AI, AES 128 based encryption and authentication. Sorry. Yeah, uh, you can do single and broadcast communication. Uh, the, the data rate is up to 250 kilobits per second, and you have a maximum of 50 devices on a line structure with 200 meter backbone and maximum 6 meter from the bus. So, yeah. Um, it looks like this uh, if you connect them. The, the yellow part is the power uh, source that is T connected. Um, yeah, uh, the telegram is uh, making use of package. Uh, package is, uh, is uh, the combination of a header and eight byte data. The header has the source and destination and priority information, and the parameter group number, which is um, uh, used to in indicate the, the message type and interpreting the data field values. Then you can have single and multi frame packages. And this would be how it may look like on your vessel. Connecting GPS receivers, autopilots, navigation instruments, uh, all these sort of things. Um, there is also the project of uh, Signal K, which is not uh, uh, the, the, the field bus itself, but it's an uh, open source universal maritime data exchange format, which makes use uh, of the NMEA. Uh, uh, it's pr pretty much bringing IoT to your boat. Uh, it's uh, dealing with the communication between instruments and sensors on board of a single vessel and it also allows to share the data between multiple vessels. Uh, it brings aids to navigation, bridges, marines and other land-based resources and uh, it's all the, the infrastructure around the, the, the communication on board of the vessel. It brings mobile apps, servers, uh, web, web apps and compatible, compatible hardware so that you can interconnect your boat. Um, uh, 
for the the apps are usually work via HTTPS, so um, at least better than HTTP uh, only. It's an actively developed uh, project and a Apache license. Uh, you can see the GitHub page here. It's also linked. Um, yeah, and the protocol and interf interface descriptions are Creative Commons by Share Alike certified. Uh, this is a schematic that shows you that it makes use of the NMEA field bus and then connects it to the cloud and brings internet to your boat. This is a little bit where the trend goes. Field buses go towards uh, internet connection. At least this is my personal opinion. And then you can use your browser to show the parameters of your vessel. Well, uh, this brings me to the conclusion and the recapitulation of what I was talking about today. We uh, mentioned field buses as a combination of sensors, actuators, a communication medium and a protocol around it. The protocol is like an operating manual regulating communication setup and challenges. The different application domains come with different flavors of field bus systems. They all have the common principles but different um, specifica. And then we talked about, I talked about the collecting, a collection of properties to describe and to compare field buses. And I hoped to give you an impression of why these properties are important or may be important when choosing a field bus or when evaluating a field bus system. Then we had a greater detailed look at KNX as an example for a field bus system in buildings and uh, into the NMEA standards that are used on maritime vessels. Yeah, and in the end I showed you that there's infrastructure around the field buses with Signal K, for example, that brings uh, the field bus towards the IoT so that you have an IoT boat if you are rich enough. Of course, everything uh, I used is not entirely painted or done by myself, so are the references uh, for everybody interested in having a look in more detail of what I mentioned. I again made use of the publicly available image material from the university's uh, Bildstatenbank image database. And if you want more, I included some links, some of them I mentioned during the presentation for further research and um, if you're curious enough. Thank you again for your attention. Uh, if you are, have questions, feel free to contact me. I hope this was a pleasant and fruitful talk to you and whoever is willing, we can still have a few minutes of discussion now. Thank you very much.